podcasts. Do you listen to other podcasts? And if so, what's your favorite one? If not, what do you like to listen to? I listen to a lot of true crime podcasts. <laughs> I would say both of us don't listen to like ongoing podcasts like yeah. this. We listen to like, um, I feel like a series, right? Like, yeah, like a one topic. Yeah, I like like a story. Yes. Podcast. Yes. Sometimes, sometimes like friends, I think they, I think like if we have friends and they like don't listen to our podcast, they sometimes feel bad and they'll be like, <laughs> they'll say, um, Oh, I, I didn't hear that. Like, I don't really listen to podcasts. And I was like, it's fine. I don't either. <laughs> like, you don't have to feel bad. <laughs> <I'd be> like, <laughs> like, if you're a friend, I mean, they're not going to hear this because they're not listening to it, but we are not upset <laughs> at all. No, <laughs> doesn't all. matter. Actually makes me feel better. Yeah. Um, I feel like, okay. So what I listen to, um, invisibilia, this American life, um, but both of us like, like, a you know, like a cereal or a, you love like the retrievals or scamanda scamanda, right. Anything like that. We like a, a psycho thriller. Yeah. Um, just like our nice cold documentaries. I would yes. say that's it. But what do you listen to? That's not podcast. I listen to music. What kind of music do you listen to? Like nineties grunge. <laughs> Yeah, you do. You, you, be, really, you do be loving 90s grunge. I love a 90s grunge. Like if I, okay, here's another question that no one asked, but I'm going to ask it now. <laughs> if you were to be stuck in a time period, what would it be? Everyone's going to say the 90s. Not everyone. I'm going to say the 90s. Are you? Me too. 100%. Anyone whose childhood was in the 90s would Lisa say Lisa Frank? Think. God, bring her back. Dude, bring her back. My trainer wears Lisa Frank nail um stick stickers like every week. Sally, she, Sally, Sally loves Lisa Frank. She gets them. Guess where Frank. she gets them? Where? Timu. <laughs> Can't mention Timu on this podcast. <laughs> I know people are going to be so disappointed when they find out we shop on Timu. I know. Because scary. I'm sure it's very unethical consumption of goods. Also, also like scary. Don't listen but to us. <laughs> just a reminder, there is no ethical consumption under capitalism. So... What are you going to do, right? Um, uh, I like to listen to Big Booty Mixes Volume 23. <laughs> do you listen to him? just Volume 23? All the other volumes. No, no, no. I'm not kidding. I literally just listened to Volume 23. It's How long is it? Aren't they so long? <laughs> it's like 50 minutes. But like, what are you doing when you're listening to it? Anything. Because I think it depends Cleaning, what I'm walking. doing. Yeah. You know, if I'm driving, which is often these days, I would rather listen to a podcast because it like distracts me or an audiobook or an audiobook or I would call someone. We talk. Yeah. You think yeah, I, you're on the phone with me. <laughs> and by someone I mean you. <laughs> 9 times out of 10. Sometimes Bill is like what are you guys even talking about? And I'm like work, obviously. <laughs> it's not not always work. Sometimes it is. Sometimes who knows? I'm like, I'm sorry. We have a lot to do. <laughs> like, like talk to each other for, I mean, we should seriously spend a week where we like calculate how much time we spend on the phone together. Like sometimes we will be together in Westchester and then we'll be on our drives home and Emily will just call me. She'll be like, Hey, what are you doing? And I'm like, I just left you. And then she gets home like an, she gets home like an hour before me, which is really sad um oh, wait good. but I but then I do feel like we're really good about not talking on the weekends about work yes I really I think we have great we have, boundaries there over the past year we have become fabulous where we really will not talk about work unless there's an emergency like I had a text you about an emergency yesterday right. about work but like unless there is we will not talk about and work. not to mention we're recording this on a Sunday <laughs> well we're not great every weekend but you know <laughs> try our best most, all right for the most part <laughs> let's get into today's topic so today we wanted to talk about this idea of being a highly sensitive, empathetic person, mm. because a lot of people write in about being very sensitive, being empathetic, and we just wanted to talk about like the nuances of it, what it might mean for you, because the more you can understand yourself, the more you can know yourself, the more you can grow yourself. <laughs> Quick plug. <laughs> Pretty cliche. Um, but you know, I think it might be important to, to kind of def have some definitions around what a highly sensitive person might be. 
And so if you're a highly sensitive person, you might have a heightened awareness to the stimuli around you, um, which can sometimes be good or bad. So you might be bothered by violence. You can be easily overwhelmed um, and it can lead you to avoid certain situations. Um, you might also be very creative and have a very deep level of empathy. Um, but I think it might be important too to, to, to make the distinction between someone who says they're like a highly sensitive person and then someone who's, you know, considered an empath. Um, and so highly sensitive people are generally more sensitive to their environment and social interactions, and it takes them longer to take in information. Um, empaths. Uh, share many qualities of highly sensitive people, uh, but, but they might have a more developed intuition and they absorb emotions like sponges. Hmm. So we wanted to put that out there because we get a lot of questions about being very sensitive. Because if you don't understand your sensitivity to the world, um, it might be hard to learn how to interact with the world and people around you. And you might feel other in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. uh, when you see people, you know, experiencing things or going through things. And for you, it feels very overwhelming. It feels taxing. And you don't know why to understand this piece about yourself might be really helpful because the more you can understand this, the more you can take the necessary steps to be able to take care of yourself so that you're reacting in a way that creates healthy, connected relationships with other people and with yourself. Good question. Okay. So you just told us the difference between these two, but could you tell us a little bit about like what this would look like, like an example for us to understand? Yeah. So, um, so for example, right? Like if you're maybe highly sensitive to people around you, you might be in a crowd of people and you might feel very overwhelmed. Mm -hmm right? Um, because there's loud noises, uh, you know, there's a lot of stimuli around you. So I would notice when you're in an environment that's maybe very overstimulating or um, there's a lot going on, what happens to you internally, right? Do you get agitated? Do you shut down? Um, really be aware of when you're in environments that are very overstimulating, what's going on for you? Um, you know, an, another example is like someone who might be in like a, so at a social event, right. And you might be identifying this as, oh, I have social anxiety, which is another, uh, kind of piece to this is that when you're in a social event for a long time, or you're around people for a long time, you're talking people to people for a long time, you might start to feel very overstimulated. And because of that, you might need to take some steps to separate yourself because you're feeling so overstimulated. Um, so that might be an example mm -hmm. of it is that there's just a lot going on around you and your boundaries with yourself and the world might be more porous. Okay. Right. Okay. So things affect you more and, you know, sometimes this can lead to low self-esteem because you see other people doing this and interacting with the world in this way that you really struggle with. And mm -hmm. To understand and accept this about yourself as opposed to being hard on yourself can also help you navigate it in a different way. Well, somebody had also said, is being an empath a real thing? Can you really feel other people's emotions? And I can tell you if you've spent 15 minutes with Jen, the answer is yes. <laughs> I don't consider myself to be an empath. I consider myself to be highly empathetic and very in tune with people's feelings, but I don't. I mean, Jen, the second someone's crying near you, you are crying. I know. Are you crying right now? Yeah. Like I can <laughs> like literally because thinking about it, like thinking about other, like it just, it happens so quickly. Yeah. Um, and even watching like on TV, if yes. I see, and you know what, it, it, the, the more I embrace it, the more it helps me decipher between real genuine emotions and Maybe someone who's crying but doesn't have the maybe like genuine emotion behind it. I don't know mm -hmm. if I can, you know, adequately explain that, but I know I've talked to you about that, that like sometimes it happens so immediately for me. If Emily tells me something and she starts tearing up, I'm immediately tearing yes. up with her. Every time. 
every we're, single time. We're like, for me, I'm like, you know, love Jen and want to be there for her, but I'm not having the same experience. Like we are. Yeah. So like, I can tell you before I knew Jen, I didn't know if this was a real thing. Yeah. hundred, a hundred percent. <laughs> yes. Um, but I didn't know this about myself for a really long time. And when I started to understand this about myself, instead of pushing it away, which I think is like a really common thing to do is to like shut down or to push other people away because you feel so overwhelmed by the world around you, you start to really understand and trust your intuition in a way that really serves you in the world. Some people, some person, someone asked, can I change this about myself? Everything makes me cry. And I used to feel this, like I really strongly used to feel this of like, oh God, like, why am I crying so much? I don't want to cry this much. And I would, I would be hard on myself about it. But the more I really embrace this and to say like, okay, I'm crying because I like feel things very deeply and it's okay for me to feel things really deeply. And how do I want to navigate that when I feel things really deeply? When I would push it away and I would shut down or I wouldn't understand what was going on, I would be much more reactive to that. I would try to hold it in. I wouldn't be able to express myself. And so if I start to tear up, I let myself tear up. Now, that doesn't mean that if Emily's sharing something with me and she's really sad about it, that I'm having a breakdown, (laughs) right? Like I'm just tearing up. You never, and you never make it about you. No, exactly. Let me be clear. Like if you made it about you, then that like- that would story. become problematic yeah and I mean it's something to think about right how does this when someone says like you know I, I'm I was crying and how do I handle this or like how do I not feel this way I think one of the things to consider is like how does this actually get in the way of your life yeah you feel things that are bigger that help your relationship make you nice like I don't really see that's as problematic <laughs> um but do you um are you not able to function in the world yeah that's going to become a problem and the more that you embrace it, the more you can can express it to other people, right? So I've really been able to say to other people, like I, I tear up really easily when I see other people tear up. It just happens. Like my mirror neurons are so strong mm-hmm. when I see other people tear up, whether it's a TV show. I tell my husband, right? Anything we're watching. <laughs> if I'm watching a show, he walks in the room and I'm, he's like, are you crying? It happens every time. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, yes, I am. They're crying on TV. And so automatically I am crying. <laughs> and so the more you understand this, the more you accept it, the more you don't beat yourself up about it, the more you can embrace it and express it to people. Mm-hmm. But I think you do have to tell the difference. And I did have a therapist say this to me a while ago when I was first understanding this about myself, where I would say like, Hey, I think I'm like a very empathetic person. I really can feel other people's emotions. Like I pick up on them. And she said to me, which I really appreciated. She said, I think you, you'd really have to make sure you're telling the difference between what's their emotion and then what's it triggering for you. And I've been very aware of that as a therapist and as a human being in my relationships. And I really try to continue to be aware of that because just as Emily said, like, I don't make it about myself, but I do have to be aware of, are these tears empathetic tears? Cause I really feel for the other person or something coming up for me. I think that sometimes it is a hard distinction to make if you haven't done this work. Because if you don't make that distinction, sometimes you can project your own stuff onto other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So let me, let me ask you this question. So you're going to answer so much of this today. I'm so sorry, but here, I'm glad. Um, How to deal with the emotional burnout of feeling everything so deeply. So when you're someone who's highly empathetic, or you consider yourself a highly sensitive person, It means that you are overly, I don't even want to say overly, extra attuned to external stimuli. You are really attuned to the outside world. Mm -hmm. What that means is you need to find balance. And in that balance, you need to be extra attuned to yourself internally. It is, it might be a lot easier for you and it might come more naturally for you 
to attune to your external environment. And so your challenge, the practice is going to be, how do you attune to your internal environment? The reason why that's important is because the more you attune to yourself internally, the more you get to say, well, where do I have to set boundaries for myself? So I don't feel so overwhelmed. An example is when I was in college, everyone was going out a lot, right? We were like at clubs, you know, there was like a lot of people around. I used to, you know, have a lot of anxiety in those environments and I didn't know why, you know, it was really hard for me to understand why. Another example is like when I would go to malls and there's a lot of people, when I'm in an environment where there's a lot of people around, I, I get really overstimulated. When I didn't understand that about myself, I didn't know what I needed to do in order to take care of myself. So the more I learned how to in, uh, attune to myself internally and say, what's going on for me, right? The more I was able to say, okay, I need to take a little bit of a break. I would go into the bathroom. I would sit in the bathroom and I would take a few minutes by myself. Um, or if I was in a mall, I would find something, you know, I would find a corner where I had to be by myself. Um, and so... That's why I also think sometimes I would consider myself an introvert is because being introverted or at least taking time for myself allows me to attune to myself internally and reset and take care of myself so that I can further interact with the world. In order to be a functioning human being in society, I need to be able to interact with the world. What that means is I'm going to experience things over and over and over again that are really stimulating to me and overly stimulating to me. And so if you don't learn to attune to your internal needs and you don't say, well, well, you know, I need a little bit more space. I need to take care of myself. What does that look like in all of these different contexts? Then you are going to be constantly flooded. So once again, what is really important is learning how to attune to your internal needs in order to balance out how much you're attuning to your external environment. Dan, I can't imagine you in a club. <laughs> I really? Know. I'm caught on the idea of you at a nightclub. I mean, listen, I'm a really good dancer. <laughs> Just you are. I've seen your <laughs> asparagus body move. Um, uh, like I can, I, I, rem I have this memory. Is this probably like 2012 of running into you at Maynard? Why was I there? I have no idea. What? Do you remember this? No. I can't remember why I was there though. <laughs> I ran into you. We weren't that close at the time. You know what I mean? Like we'd hung out in yeah, grad yeah. school and stuff, but like we weren't how we are now. And that was probably the most populated place I'd ever seen you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that when I was in college, a way that I would deal with it is to drink alcohol. Like, yeah. I think that that really allowed me to function a little. And so I would ask yourself that question is, are you using substances in order to navigate this? Um, I think that that it was a very socially acceptable way for me to set boundaries between, you know, when I was really overstimulated, it really did help. But if that is the coping mechanism that you turn to all the time, it can very easily transform into a coping mechanism that ends up hurting you. So to be very aware of how much you're using substances in order to create that boundary, because it might feel easier than actually actively creating that boundary for yourself. So I think when I was in college, that was something that was really helpful for me. And then I, as I got out of that, I really had to look at myself and say, well, how, how do I actually do this? How do I do this with human beings? How do I do this in my relationships? How do I express this to other people that this is what I go through? Um, and that took time. It took time to figure out. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, okay. I'm not an HSP, but my mom is. How do I respect her feelings without me going insane? Hmm. So the question is, right, so this is what we talk about, like, towards, like, dysfunction in relationships. Yeah. What makes you go insane? So, like, the question I think we would have to really understand here is what is the full dynamics happening between you and your mom? Yeah, because I would want to understand, like, what, 
what is your mom saying that makes her a highly sensitive person that it's, it's not for, for you to attach yourself to this and just say, well, I'm highly sensitive. So everything affects me. And so you have to tiptoe around me is also not fair. Yes. You know, you can express that you're very sensitive, Mm -hmm. right? So like, if I'm really sensitive, someone says something to me that hurts my feelings and said, well, I'm a highly sensitive person. So like, you can't say those things to me is not a fair boundary, right? You might say like, Hey, I'm really sensitive. Like that, that, that hurt my feelings. I know that I, I, I'm going to take time to process this. And then like, we can talk about this. Um, so your mom might be highly sensitive. I would also, you know, want to understand how is she communicating that she's highly sensitive and how do you guys talk through it? Because I just wonder, I'm assuming here too. I just wonder if she might just be saying, I'm really sensitive. You can't say those things to me, or you have to take care of me in this way. And it isn't fair if you're someone who's very sensitive to say, well, you have to take care of me more because I'm really sensitive. You can express that you're really sensitive to people and have them understand that about you because it's important to understand each other in relationships. But you also have to learn how to take care of that part for yourself. And if you feel hurt by something to look at, well, what's this bringing up for me? And how do I want to work through this in my relationships? Because you don't want your family and your friends to be tiptoeing around you because you identify with this. Mm -hmm. So I really like this question that I want to talk about, which is how to cope in a world that values cutthroat behavior and sees sensitivity as a weakness. One of the things I also want to talk about is that there's so much conversation around the importance of vulnerability, which we believe 100 gajillion percent. The thing is, it is not always safe to be vulnerable and honest with everyone, right? So especially in a workplace, be careful what you're using and what you are sharing. You are wonderful and what you have to say is important, but not around people that are going to use it against you or use it um, with a lack of safety. Mm. So keep this in mind right like how you cope in this world I, some people are like well just be like that or, oh, god i remember this book what was that book that was like um how to like how to think like a man or so or how to like write like do you remember this book that i'm talking about which is basically about like how to be like a man in the workplace like i don't want to i don't want right. to be like a man i want to be myself and i want to work with a bunch of women and like i want yes. to be like that yeah um but sometimes it feels like it's the only option and so if you're somebody who's more sensitive, more empathetic, it's true. Like walking around crying at work is probably not going to help you. Yeah. And so how do you take time? You used a really good example of like, do I go to the bathroom? Do I take time to take care of myself? How do I learn to ground myself? What's my inner di- dialogue? How do I know how to leave for the day mm-hmm. or know when I just can't attend something or go to something? And this really comes with knowing and being willing to look at yourself. The world's and- not going to change. It is what it is. It's up to us to figure out how we're going to navigate within it. And I think what happens is because, because it feels like, oh, I have to assimilate to this world of, you know, not being sensitive. I need to toughen up that when we are sensitive and when we do feel things so deeply, as opposed to allowing ourselves to feel it, we beat ourselves up for it. And you're beating yourself up for something that's comes so naturally to you, Mm -hmm. right? It's something you feel deeply and it's okay that you feel deeply. And when you're hard on yourself about it, you're going to feel even deeper and you're going to struggle with that. You need to accept this part of yourself in order to be able to navigate it and to be able to say, well, what do I want to do with this in the workplace? What do I want to do with this in my friendships? Um, To dismiss this part of yourself to say, oh, well, I can't be sensitive. I can't cry, right? You're allowed to cry. Let yourself cry, right? Maybe in the workplace, it's not going to work for you, but like go to the bathroom Mm -hmm. at home, have a good cry at home. If you're struggling with something, cry it out. Crying can be so helpful. There's a reason why we cry. There are a lot of benefits to crying. There are reasons why babies cry. It's self, it is a self-soothing mechanism. And so if that's coming naturally for you, allow yourself to cry, get it out. Um, And don't be hard on yourself about it because if you're being hard on yourself about it, your feelings are going to intensify as opposed to saying, this is the way I'm taking care of myself is to allow myself to cry, is to give myself the space to feel this. 
Do you want to hear the benefits of crying? Yes, he looked it up. Okay, yes, I did. You know, someone had to. Um, <laughs> one, crying reduces cortisone. That's what it is. Okay, it enhances cortisol. Our- cortisol. Cortisone is cortisone cream. Okay, great. <laughs> so things are going well today. <laughs> it did. It did. It enhances cortisone cream. It does. It's great. Right. Um, okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's so hard to not laugh about this. <laughs> Benefits of crying. Enhanced mood. Crying balances emotions. Tears remove toxins. Crying is resolution process grief. Fights bacteria. Crying is actually good for fighting bacteria in our eyes. Um, it reduces the stress hormones. Dulls pain. Blah, blah, blah. There's a million things. Improves vision. Wow. I didn't know that. Maybe my eyes suck because I'm not crying enough. Listen, <laughs> we got to work on that. Wait, um, so, oh, wait, I have to tell you what comes up. What? Research says, somebody had said how often is normal to cry. A research study came up. Women cry emotional tears several times a month or 30 to 64 times a year, while men may cry once every month or two. Five to 17 times a year. Women are crying 30 to 64 times a year, and men are crying five to 17 times a year. Could that is that true? Do you think it's from a study in May 2023? Absolutely. And listen, if you're listening to this and you're like, I cry more than that, that's okay. I cry less than that, probably. <laughs> I, you know, I haven't cried in a while, but when I do, I let it, I let it out and I yeah, listen. Yeah, you're kind of dead right now. Yeah. You're you going know, through some just, stuff. Uh, yeah. I'm just, I'm compartmentalizing hard. <laughs> yes, you are. I understand. Yes, 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 yes. Um, okay. Um, we have to get to your MJ. We, let's, let's do a, in a, one more oh, question. I'm sorry. Okay. Wait, one more. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, you, why don't you choose? I've chosen all these other ones. Okay. Let me see. My partner is highly sensitive and emotional. How do I not be so rude when they're being what I think is dramatic? So once again, I really want to understand the dynamics here. I want to understand. Are they being dramatic and using it as manipulation? It could be. Right. Like, like yeah. is there manipulation there? That's a question. Or, right, are they really struggling with something? Mm-hmm. And is it hard for you to gain empathy for them? Because maybe you wouldn't feel the same in that situation. Or you've never been allowed to feel the same. Exactly. Someone told you that you're not allowed to feel your feelings. And maybe Mm -hmm. someone told your partner that they were, right? And they really allow themselves to feel it. My question for you is why are you becoming rude? Yeah, why are you so reactive to it? Why are you so reactive to it? And that's why I want to know. Is it because it's some sort of manipulation and you can feel that? Or is it because you're uncomfortable with your own sensitivity? And so to see that in someone else, to see your partner expressing that is really uncomfortable for you. Mm -hmm. And so instead of embracing that and saying like, I understand, is there anything I can do for you to be able to say you know, if you're going into, well, uh, you're being overly dramatic because someone told you that. And so I want to, I want to figure out, and obviously yeah. I can't ask you more questions, the difference between those two. Mm-hmm. I think for some people, they will use it as a form of manipulation um, because it's the only thing that's ever worked, right? right. So if your whole um, childhood, the only way you got your needs met was from um, sort of falling apart yes. or using, you know, then you're going to keep doing it, right? Like we learn how to survive and it doesn't always help us thrive. I love that you said that um, because I do want you to ask yourself if you are identifying as someone who's highly sensitive and breaks down. Once again, it's okay, but I want you to ask yourself, is this because this does feel so overwhelming or am I looking for a reaction from someone else when I'm doing this? Mm -hmm. Like as you're breaking down, ask yourself what, what's going on here and be honest with yourself. Yeah. Because uh, you may have learned this as a coping mechanism and it's no longer working for you. Ready for Dear Emma Jen? I'm ready. It's a very long one. Oh, I'm ready. Okay. Dear Emma Jen, I've realized in recent years that I was emotionally parentified as a child by my mother. She has extremely weak boundaries and relied on me for emotional support through her divorce. She shared her stresses about my father and her finances 
while emphasizing that I'm the light in her life and I bring her so much joy. Now I'm a people-pleasing adult that is learning to set firmer boundaries, particularly with my mom. I find myself feeling responsible for her happiness and constantly concerned with making sure she's not lonely. She's set up for life for herself where she she set up a life for herself where she has no partner, no family around except for me and only a few friends. I feel extreme guilt when I don't see her every week and it feels like it's never enough. Seeing her as an obligation rather than something fun. More recently, I've been struggling with guilt from saying no to dog sitting for her so she can go visit family up north. It's a hassle for me to take care of her dogs, and I don't believe it's my responsibility. She makes passive-aggressive comments when I say no. I feel like if I just comply and do what she wants, she'd be happier. How do I overcome the guilt and shame I feel for not having the capacity to be her everything? I have resentment that I'd love to release so I can enjoy my time with her while also prioritizing my own wants and needs unapologetically. Ugh. First of all, uh, love this person, right? Love, love you. You're doing amazing work. I'm so impressed. What you are doing is very difficult to do. And I'm incredibly, incredibly impressed with this person for yes, doing this work. Because this okay. is not easy. No, it's, it's hard as hell. Okay. Um, your first thoughts and reactions. My first thought is that what I want to say to you is it was never and is not your responsibility to take care of your mom's emotional needs. And it makes sense to me that you're feeling resentment and that you're burnt out because this is something that was expected of you as a child. And the flow of care was off, right? Where mom was looking to you to take care of her, where it was important for mom to be the one taking care of you and your needs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I love that you say now I'm a people-pleasing adult that is learning to set firmer boundaries, which is wonderful. And let us just say, this is a journey. This does not happen overnight. The fact that you're recognizing where you fall in this because of your upbringing is a really important step. The guilt that you feel is coming from past wounds. Yeah. Guilt has been built in as a way to take care of mom. And so you may need to feel that guilt and understand that just because you're feeling guilty doesn't mean that you need to take care of mom and actually taking care of mom when you're feeling guilty is just recreating that cycle again. And so it might be important to put this out on the table with mom to that's, be able to, go ahead, mm -hmm. what are we going to say? Well, I said, that's what I'm thinking is it, it's time yeah. for a conversation. Yeah. But I said, she said something so beautifully and at no point does she attack her mom. Right. She's not sitting here saying, oh, my mom's the worst and I hate her. What the most amazing thing that she says is, I have resentment that I'd love to release so I can enjoy my time with her. That's what has to be said to your mom. Mom, I love you. Our relationship means something so significant to me. You are so important to me. And I don't want there to be rupture and wounds here. I, I don't want to have any feelings towards you. And here's the thing. Your mom may not react well to this conversation. That's not your problem. How someone else reacts is not why we do it. We do it because that's how you release the anger. That's your goal. We're going to tell you how to do it. You got to say it. You got to say it so you don't turn into some of the passive aggressiveness that she's doing because it's already being modeled for you. Reminder to go back and listen to our episode on passive aggressiveness. Yes. So the thing I want you to really keep in mind here is what needs to be said and then what is the expectations I'm trying to have with that conversation and what happens if they're not met? Yeah. Is my mom going to reject me? Okay, she might for a while. If mom has passive aggressive um, uh, traits that she does, she might give you the silent treatment a little bit. That's okay. Let her have that space. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Let her do these things. You still need to say what's important and significant for you. Yeah. And you can say something to the effect of, mom, listen, I love you. I care about you so much, but it isn't my job to take care of you in this way. And it's really important 
in order to preserve our relationship that I express this to you. Because if I don't, I'm going to build up resentment. As your daughter, it is not my job to take care of your emotional needs. Mm -hmm. And so I understand that that might be really hard to hear. And it does not mean that I don't love you and I don't care about you. Saying this is my attempt to preserve the relationship that we have. I want to make sure that we're close. And in order to do that, I have to be able to express myself and set my boundaries. And so what that means is when you are struggling with something, you're going to need to go to someone else. Other, There might be friends, a therapist, other people that you have to go to. Once again, it is not because I don't love you. I love you very much. I just want to make sure that I preserve our relationship by being able to express myself and being able to set this boundary because it's building up a lot of resentment for me. You could go a step further and say, and, and I wrote into next door to get you some names of some dog sitters. There it is. <laughs> Strong boundary right there. <laughs> but hey, here, here are dog sitters. This person, you're killing it. You're badass. You're tough yes. as hell. You got this. We appreciate you. Thank you for writing this in. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode of Shrink Chicks. We'll see you back here next week for another session. In the meantime, if you want a question answered or a topic discussed, follow us on Instagram at Shrink Chicks. And if you're looking to get connected with a therapist like us to start or continue your therapeutic journey, visit the therapygroup.com. Just fill out a contact form on our website and we will personally match you with one of our amazing therapists. And for all of our therapists and group practice owners out there, we also offer group practice consulting. And if you're looking to support yourself further and support our show, check out our amazing merch options at shrinkchicks.com slash merch and our Know Yourself, Grow Yourself journal on Amazon. Also, if you'd be so kind, we'd love a rating review and for you to share with a friend or an enemy or a mother-in-law, honestly, whoever needs it so that we can keep reaching more people on our mission to bring mental health topics to your ears every week. Thanks for being here with us. And don't forget to grow yourself. You got to know yourself. Thank you.